Okay. Okay. Milk or the With milk. Thank you, sir. Hey, Warren. <laughs> okay, we're running a couple of minutes late. I don't know why. Um, okay, so welcome to this session. Uh, what we're going to talk about is uh, uh, a couple of things, but uh, uh, basically an information session and a, a discussion about the upcoming textbook that uh, Randy and War uh, Martin and myself have finally completed. Um, and the order of proceeding will be that I'll talk for a little while and then Randy's going to talk about some specific issues that he wanted to relate and then Martin's going to talk about some specific issues and I'll recap for a couple of minutes after that. So just to give the, uh, a general thing, this is a, we, we published a book, an introductory text last year and we put it through Amazon because we had to get it out within the, a day after we'd finished writing the manuscript so it could be used in... Uh, teaching program in in Southern Hemisphere, so we didn't have time for the publication process. So that was just to get it out, and uh, then we set set about finalising that into uh, a two a two year sequence. And we Macmillan Palgrave, who you know the largest textbook publisher in the world, uh, contracted us to to finalise it. It's going to come out in April 2018. Finally. This has been going for 10 years. This has taken us 10 years to write. And one of the reasons for that is that it was always pushed back as a priority because we had other things we had to do. And uh, particularly in my case, uh, you know, I run a research centre and we're always having to earn money to pay staff and to keep ourselves going. So all of those projects always become priorities. And, and, the, and, the, and writing books is more interesting than writing a textbook. So the textbook just goes down and down the priority list, and uh, um, that's why it took so long, in part. Uh, but, it, but the other reason it took so long is because it's quite a complex process. It's, uh, it's quite different. A journal article is easy to write. You can write a journal article in a couple of days once you become experienced. A book it takes you maybe three months once you get experienced. A textbook takes much longer. It's a much more complicated process because it's not only just a text needs to be written, you've got to think about the pedagogy, the, the, the order and all of those things. So this particular book is a two year undergraduate sequence and uh, because we've, uh, we've got contacts all around the world, we, we tried to make it as generic two year undergrad, uh, what, we tried to make the, uh, the meaning of undergraduate generic, in other words that it will be suitable for, for Britain, US, Australia, and Europe. Um, and it's unashamedly based upon modern monetary theory. It's not a textbook where, uh, as I say there, it's not a, here's the mainstream and we don't like it and this is why we don't like it type of textbook. It's, it's modern monetary theory as we've developed it from, from core, from scratch, the small, the small group that started all of this. Um, uh, I'll talk a bit about the, uh, the, the review process, of course when you, a textbook uh, goes out for review to reviewers uh, in the academy and uh, some of the reviews were hysterical from the mainstream, uh, it's quite amazing. <laughs> and it really demonstrated to me exactly why the economics profession is, is, is dead in its current form. Uh, and I said there's been a lot, it's been a long process. And here are some thought processes and about how we came to do this. So this, uh, just this is, this is from the publisher. This is what I call the biology textbook. This is their current preferred cover. And, and I find <laughs> and apparently the uh, spirally thing is meant to reflect innovation. I don't know how it does that. <laughs> uh, I'm opposing that one at the moment. This is the uh, 1960s retro look, which I quite, which uh, among the three authors, I was the only one that liked, and I think that's because I'm a bit of a retro character. Uh, and then, of course, we decided to modernise the retro, retro look, and so they came up with this. 
And uh, <laughs> because I hate uh, the black cover, we've, they're now experimenting with a blue cover, as oh. I'm told, but we haven't got it back yet. So who knows what it's going to be in the end. But basically, it's going to be called Macroeconomics, and they're the authors in, in, uh, of the book. Uh, just to, to, to note that it started off, uh, Randy and I started this off quite a long time ago, and then Martin came into the project later, and thank God he did, uh, uh, God being something unspecified, <laughs> uh, uh, not to betray any, uh, anything specific. Uh, but thank God he did, because it, he, he gave us the extra uh, labour the extra incent the extra sort of intellectual support and uh, enthusiasm uh, because at times we were pretty dead um, the, the, chal the challenge you know when you're trying to write a book that's going to run completely against the, the, the mainstream and you don't want it to be a facile exercise in other words you want to actually it actually be used because it's 900 pages of uh, trees that have gone into it, each book. And uh, as I said, 10 years of, uh, at times, pretty hard labour. Uh, you want it to be useful. So the challenge is that, that in the field that we operate and, and, and how it spills out into the public, macro concepts are uh, constantly being paraded out there. There's sort of a... people. Uh, uh, encouraged to intuitively relate it to their own experience and as we know intuition is quite often a, a major source of error in reasoning our intuition obviously leads us wrong uh, one of the problems in more recent era is that social media exacerbates the problem of misconception in, that the media summarises from the academy so you start to get the blogosphere who uh, uh, effect where you've got all of these macroeconomic experts out there who who just reiterate and reinforce the problem. Um, you've got ideological agendas. Despite I remember in my first lecture in economics, I was told that I was entering a discipline that was value free, and uh, this was called positive economics, and uh, all the normative things were on the side. When we came to talk about equity, we have to talk about and justice. We might have to talk about equity, but for the for the main core of the discipline, it was value free. Well, that's nonsense, of course. And uh, the 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 success of the neoliberal agenda is is in no small part. And the last session in this room was was a demonstration of that to the way they frame their arguments and the language they use. And so when you're trying to write a textbook, you know, one of the things I learned when I was a young economist was that uh, one of the reasons why Keynes's uh, general theory was kidnapped <coughs> and hijacked by the neoclassical synthesis was because of chapter two, and uh, which was essentially using what I call neoclassical frames and neoclassical language. And uh, so, so for a textbook writer, we had to be very, very cautious that we did that we used language and framing that that wouldn't be hijacked and would uh, have some distinction. So teaching an anti-groupthink course is a pretty big challenge, uh, and we had we were aware that there's a huge cognitive dissonance out there that has to be un continually undone. It's, it's uh, subliminal, it's, uh, un it's unconscious. And uh, so that's, that was the challenge. Uh, I, I don't think I'm going to really talk anything about this. Uh, just to summarise the last two points, really there's nothing in, and this, this relates to how much content that exists in the existing body of macroeconomics textbook literature. How much of that is usable in a in a pedagogy that's uh, unashamedly modern monetary theory? And the answer is virtually none. The uh, the the, uh, the teaching programs in our undergraduate courses around the world basically are fake knowledge. There's virtually nothing of use or self salvageable material in what's taught 
in, in mainstream macroeconomic textbooks. But then there, there is a certain advantage in a student knowing the non-knowledge. Even though you don't want to privilege it, there's some advantage in the student understanding the non-knowledge. And the other challenge, of course, is that when we talk about macroeconomics, it's an abstraction. Now, for non-economists, I'm not going to explain that too much. But there is no such... There is, really is no such thing as a price level. It's an abstraction that we've invented. And most of macroeconomics is, is a sort of abstraction. <coughs> because our, our individual experience is, is, is a micro-experience. And so when we have... Uh, and there's all these dodges that go in, dodges being, you know, tricks that go into constructing a macroeconomics argument. And so that's quite tricky in terms of um, uh, uh, building a learning environment for, for all of us who, who are micro-oriented in our experience and thinking to build a macroeconomic experience and knowledge set. Uh, who are we serving? It goes back to that of privileging of non-knowledge and how much non-knowledge should the student know. And uh, this is a... This is this idea of the balance between pragmatism and knowledge acquisition. And the problem that we... And, and the reviews that we got from the publishers certainly demonstrated this uh, to perfection. And this is the argument. You can't teach that, Bill, because the students won't ever be able to get a job if they go to the interview and tell the employer that the government doesn't have a financial constraint. The Australian Commonwealth Treasury in Australia or the Central Bank will never employ them. And so there's this idea, well, what, what's, it, what's the teaching program meant to be? Is it meant to be developing knowledge and critical thinking? Or is it teaching them fake knowledge because everybody else is teaching fake knowledge and the employers use that as the screen in which they fire people? And so that's a real tricky thing for a textbook writer who's, who's on the, from our persuasion because we've got a moral duty to our students to make sure that they are getting the best out of their participation in their higher education. But we've, but we've got to... We've got, and, and so we've got to be aware of the pragmatics of the situation. But we've also got a moral duty to not lie to them. And most of my colleagues lie to their students every day across the globe when they go into an economics class. And so that's a, that's a tricky thing and we had to, we had to walk that tightrope. Uh, the other point is about student-centred centred learning. And this has came out in the textbook market and uh, uh, in recent days. This is this new fad that uh, that students drive curriculum. What interests them should be what teachers teach. And of course I summarise why I don't like that by saying they don't know what they don't know. And uh, there's something about doing a, a PhD program and have, getting a doctorate and having years of experience of research that in some way should privilege the position of that person against a, a neophyte who's 17 or 18 years of age who doesn't have any of that experience. And that's it. So, but at the same time, you don't want to have dictatorial classrooms where there's no room for feedback and response and interaction. Uh, and this problem's uh, recently been demonstrated because I net this is George Soros's little uh, toy, uh, the, the, they created this core econ group which was going to revolutionise the economics undergraduate curriculum and the textbook curriculum. And last week, the, and this is why I say it's really good, it came out last week, they produced, they released their textbook. And uh, it's being, you know, salivated by the journalists. I mean, the, the, the New Yorker was salivating about it the other day, the, the Guardian's salivating and saying, 
and what a fantastic thing this is. This is, this is the best thing for, for academics. They've got a new progressive program that gives, <coughs> that enfranchises the students because it's student centred. It, uh, the authors went out and did uh, focus groups and students told them they wanted to know this and they wanted to learn about this and that, you know, and it's, it's all the sort of, sort of stuff that you think. And, well, you only have, it takes till chapter 14, by the way, to, for the government to enter the picture. <laughs> Whereas in our textbook, the government enters the picture in chapter one. Uh, and then when you finally get to, you finally get to meet the currency issue in this radical new progressive book that's uh, redefining the undergraduate curriculum, you get the government must borrow to cover the gap between its revenue and expenditure without a qualifier saying that according to current voluntary institutional structures set up by the political process. And uh, so, you know, you don't, we haven't got time to go through all of this. But essentially, the conclusion is that this is an, just another neoliberal tract dressed up to be progressive because INET says it's an institute of new economic thinking. Well, it's a con. And, you know, this is... Uh, this is group th what I call group thinking in practice. That uh, the, 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 the INET process was, was initially probably well-meaning well and then it got hijacked back into the mainstream and they think if they add a little bit about the crisis and uh, a little bit about inequality, it's suddenly a, uh, a, a radical progressive trap. And it's the way my profession always responds to, responds to anomaly in ad hoc ways to basically salvage their, their hegemony in the profession. That's what groupthink does, mob rule. Uh, and this came out too in the review process. We had some fantastic reviews. I mean, <laughs> you know, they, they cheered my day up when the publisher from Britain sent them to us by email. I know, they were great. Uh, we were told that we were, too, we were old fashioned because we mentioned Keynes and Marx and Kolesky. We, were, we had too much history in there as opposed to none that's in the mainstream textbooks. None. Uh, we, we were ideological. Why? Because we presented conflictual views. We acknowledged that there was a debate rather than a sort of homogenous, this is the model, take it and, and accept it because we're telling you that. Uh, uh, and we, of course, ignore the mainstream DSGE model that dominates everybody, every main policy-making institution in macroeconomics, which is, for non-economists, the worst non-knowledge that exists in my profession. And as I say, garbage in, garbage out. All of the criticisms were the, the worst of the, the things my profession operates. And later op-eds, written by one of the reviewers, by the way, man, I didn't tell you that, uh, came out and said that we were a bunch of cranks, charlatans and sellers of snake oil. <laughs> <laughs> and I wrote, I wrote to the vice-chancellor of the university where the academic uh, resides and is in, paid very well. And I said, is this your, is this your standard of, uh, of public interchange between professors? And, and uh, he wrote back and said it was a good, he was just in the spirit of debate. So the mainstream, <laughs> bunch of cranks. And I'm happy to be a crank <laughs> if, if they're normal. Um, <clears throat> We had, to, we had to stress the importance of framing and language. We also had to uh, walk this tightrope of formalism and narrative because, of course, my profession alienates people because we use mathematics. But there are good reasons to use mathematics. And so we had to have a balance between when we used it to make sure that it was useful to use it rather than just wanking. <laughs> and I'm sorry to, I'm sorry to use a, a male type of imagery uh, so we, we, there is certainly formalism in the book 
but where we think it only serves a purpose rather than for its own sake. Because my profession has become obsessed with formalism and we, and, and we were accused of not having enough formalism in it. Uh, we also are aware a lot of uh, progressive side uh, don't value uh, uh, econometrics and statistical skills. Uh, but I'm an econometrician, a time series econometrician, and trained in mathematical statistics. And I value that, that capacity very much because you really can't engage with the policy debate unless you can deal with numbers, unless you can calculate stuff and do, do some regressions and, and understand statistics and dealing with data. And so in the book, unashamedly, there's a lot of empirical interaction between the conceptual level and the, and the, the applied level. Uh, and that's a reflection of our duty of care to, to provide an education. And the last, the other point I'd make, and I've got about three minutes to go, the, the other point I'd make is that uh, because Randy's American and, uh, and we live in Australia, we wanted the book, and we're, we're aware of what goes on in Europe, we wanted the book to be generic, usable by any, any program. And so we had, to, we had to get the thought police out and stop Randy using, the, using Fed when, when we should be using Central Bank. And, and so we had to, we, we had, and it wasn't only him because we used our own jargon as well, but the point is we had to come up with a generic jargon that, that everybody could understand rather than specific institutional jargon that's relatable to just one country or, or something like that. Uh, uh, and this is a, a, a this is too complicated to go through, of course. I just want to give you a flavour. It's in eight parts. The first part is about introduction and measurement, history, NEPA, labour market measuring, sectoral accounting, stocks and flows. So you immediately see something very different there in, a, in an undergraduate textbook. Uh, uh, methods, tools. So we're, tra we're giving students uh, algebraic skills, uh, mathematical skills, modelling skills. Uh, and, and the very important part of that first part is framing and language. We teach students about metaphor, metaphors, about use of language, about how to frame discussions and what that means to, to the way people learn and understand things. And you won't see that in an undergraduate macro textbook. Uh, part two is about currency, money and banking. And here we meet the government formally and uh, we reach an understanding of balance sheets and accounting and uh, banking and stock flow consistency. Won't find that in very many books. Uh, part three is about, is, is a pretty standard national income output and determination section, except we go back to a nominal world, what I call a nominal world, Randy will probably shrink, that we go back to a nominal world where we start with Keynes. And so we teach students to, a national income output and employment determination going from what I call nominal to real, uh, uh, not eliminate, because money is crucial to understanding all of that. Uh, the next part four is about unemployment and inflation, and again, you see a very distinctive way of dealing with that Phillips curve uh, topic, because we put it, we construct it really, ultimately, in terms of buffer stocks. And buffer stocks are one of them, a major innovation in my view of modern money theory. And so we, we students come out of that real understanding that unemployment is always a choice of government, always a choice of government. Uh, and so I won't I won't go further there. Part five is about uh, economic policy and open economy, and uh, we talk. This is a, this is core MMT stuff. Uh, students learn about fiscal space, so you know, IMF talk always about fiscal space, but they're talking about it in financial terms. The core MMT is that fiscal space can only mean something in real terms. What's available, what the government, what's available for the government to purchase? That's, that's your fiscal space. And uh, we, we do much more detailed analysis of monetary policy, banking, 
and the open economy. And um, uh, Randy's going to come soon and talk about Keynes, and Martin's going to talk a bit about the open economy. Because one of the major criticisms of MMT is, oh, it's American-centric. And I always sort of laugh at that, because I'm not an American, and uh, I'm one of the originals. And, uh, and I come from a small... You know, it doesn't work in a small open economy. I've always get told that. Well, I live in a small open economy. I know what, what it's like to live in a small open economy. Very different to here. And MMT works perfectly as, a, as, a, as an understanding vehicle. Uh, part six is economic instability. We talk about investment there. We talk about Minsky. We talk about crises. Part seven is, is where we talk about history of thought. And note, here we've got ISLM. So we've, ISLM for non-economists is the, uh, one of the major organising framework, teaching frameworks in, a, in standard undergraduate texts. Well, we've, we, we're putting it, we think students probably should know about it because the employer is going to ask them about it. And so if they're clever, they'll say, oh, I know all about it. And, uh, but we do it as history of thought because it was an important component of the development of our, the intellectual development of our history of our discipline. And all the rest of it means that some of those things down in behind here, all of this nonsense, <laughs> we're putting it in history of thought because it, because people, a lot of people have written about it and they, they talk about it. So students should have an idea of sort of what it is. Uh, uh, and then the final part is contemporary debates. So range of topics, you can see them up there. And, the, and that gives us some flexibility for updates as the, as the sort of contemporary issues change. And uh, we do a specific thing about the global financial crisis. And then the final chapter is a recap, really reinforcing the pedagogy. So I'm going to hand over to Randy. We forgot that. <laughs> well, you got 25 years of history. Is it too late? It is too late. Uh, yeah. Well, as, as Bill was saying, we felt we needed to put the mainstream in, but not as uh, a theory that would be useful at all. It's sort of the way you would put in the, the theory that everything revolves around the Earth. You wouldn't put that in as science. You would put it in as, you know, yeah, people used to think this, and so we included it. So we're not doing the history of thought of modern money theory because we're presenting it as this is the useful theory for understanding macroeconomics. Um, so uh, I'm going to be focusing on um, how we treat Keynes. And uh, I derive much more inspiration from Keynes than than Bill did. I've known Bill from the post-Keynesian thought uh, network days, which is the early 90s, and Bill drives more inspiration from Marx. But I was really pleasantly uh, surprised as we were writing this. Uh, Bill, Bill's goal in this was to do what is common in the other macro texts, is to sort of build up a model, right? Because this is the way that economists do it. and. Um, I didn't really know what he had in mind, but the model that he built up is a Keynesian model. Um, so I'm just going to talk a, a bit about how we treat uh, Keynes's general theory in the textbook. From my perspective, if you can see the list here, these are the important chap the most important chapters of the general theory. These are the essential chapters. And unfortunately, as Bill already referred to chapter two, uh, the way that it is presented uh, confuses uh, students and virtually everyone who reads it. Um, most of these chapters are difficult chapters. Uh, for example, chapter 17, there are very, very few people who actually uh, understand what that chapter is all about. It's usually just skipped over by most readers of the general theory. And these later chapters also I think are really misunderstood by students and by the, the profession. So we wanted to make sure 
that we got all of these uh, right in uh, the textbook, and I, I think that we do. Um, so I'm going to uh, just present uh, a quick summary of our chapters that sort of present the ideas that are in these chapters from the general theory. So it's the arrow. Okay, good. And hopefully you can uh, see most of this from your seat. On the left-hand side uh, is just the chapter 11, which is where we introduce the theory that Keynes was arguing against. And uh, for the Keynes scholars here, you know that uh, it was not coherent. Keynes is the one who actually had to make it coherent. Uh, so he said, if this is your conclusion, this must be what you believe. Okay? Um, so we are presenting that uh, classical system. A lot of you know that there is a problem in this term classical and neoclassical. It really is the neoclassical system, but Keynes called it the classical system. And most people, when they talk about the debate between Keynes and orthodoxy, it's framed as Keynes versus the classicals. So we decided in the end to keep that term. So we just present the typical neoclassical labor market production function, interest rates determined in low funds market, and then price is determined through the quantity theory of money. We don't do the AS and AD treatment that you find in other textbooks because we're not going to use AD and AS in our textbook. Okay, We will do it the way Keynes actually did it. And then at the end, uh, uh, some of these sections I have yellow on because I, I pulled these off my syllabus. And uh, for the undergrads, 11.8 is a pretty difficult uh, one. So in my course, uh, that's an optional. Uh, here we um, have uh, Ricardo, a bit of a discussion on Ricardo and Say's Law and uh, Marx's refutation of um, Ricardo's arguments, uh, nothing could be more childish. And the introduction of the MCM prime is all in that section. Chapter 12, uh, we present Keynes's arguments against the classicals. Um, and uh, as Bill said, Keynes decided to accept as much as he possibly could from the classical arguments and then just argue against one part of it. And to show that by dropping one assumption, you completely destroy their whole uh, conclusions, especially the policy conclusion. Um, so the, we argue that there are three ways that he goes about uh, doing this. The first, even Keynes himself uh, said, is not theoretically fundamental. Although, if readers understand any part of his argument, this is the one they always trot out as being his reputation. And Keynes argued that this one is, is not fundamental, and it's not. And that is that we observe in the real world that when inflation goes up, people don't all quit their jobs because their real wage has declined. Okay. Well, yes, that's true. That's an observation. It's not theoretical. Okay. Uh, what is fundamental, Keynes argued, is that they bargain over nominal wages, and I'll come back to that. They cannot bargain over the real wage, and the uh, neoclassical labor market uses a real wage. Okay? But what's even more important it comes at the very end of his chapter two, and so we introduce that and then take it up in the next chapter, which is that uh, he, he provides a definition of involuntary un unemployment. <laughs> if a rise in effective demand leads to a, a rise in employment, then you must have had involuntary unemployment. So actually, the answer is the theory of effective demand, which he did not want to present in chapter two. Okay, he just hints at it at the very end. Again, we have a, um, a section at the end that critiques loanable funds and shows an impact of it, it, an increase of saving on the interest rate is indeterminate. And, uh, for the people who've read the general theory, you know that Keynes actually had a, a graph in the general theory demonstrating this. Um, and very surprising that he chose this one thing to uh, present graphically in the general theory. OK, uh, chapter um, 13 is the theory of effective demand. 
And uh, we use the D and Z curves approach um, and present the arguments that Keynes had given for doing it this way. So expectations uh, are um, uh, treated directly in the graphs. Um, and he uses appropriate measuring units, which is only money and labor, quantities of labor, say labor hours. Equilibrium occurs at the point of effective demand. And so here is my one sentence statement of the theory of effective demand. Firms hire the amount of labor they think they need to produce the amount of output they think they can sell at a profit. And then this uh, you know, provides the more powerful rejection of the neoclassical labor market, which is that uh, even if you could uh, employ more workers at a lower wage, you're not going to employ them if you don't believe it, there's going to be profit down the road from hiring them. So unemployed labor cannot um, get employed, not because of the wage that they're demanding, but because of the expected profits that firms need in order to employ we then go into the uh, individual curves, the D curve and the Z curve. The D curve has two components. Uh, D1 is a function of employment. It has a positive slope, but declines because as employment goes up, the uh, uh, spending, say the propensity to consume, is less than one. And so uh, it goes up by less than the wage that's paid. Then we talk about D2, which is the autonomous component. And so typically in textbooks, the first is treated as consumption and the second is treated as investment. We treat it more generally. The Z curve, uh, the slope rises with employment. And this isn't because of diminishing marginal productivity, but because of bottlenecks and expected rising costs. So the policy implications uh, are that if the point of effective demand is not at full employment, then you need some kind of uh, policy in order to increase out your demand. But uh, we warn that you can't think of this as uh, a justification for fine tuning because it's very difficult since you're dealing with expectations. So it's very difficult to know uh, how much you would have to uh, increase exports or reduce taxes or increase government spending in order to get full employment. Um, we then move into um, what lies behind uh, the supply and demand curves. Um, we build a, an aggregate supply and aggregate demand um, curves uh, with the labor demand behind this. So aggregate supply and aggregate demand are independent. Lowering wages affects both, and this is why falling wages may not increase employment. Um, in, uh, you notice I have two of the sections highlighted in yellow and highlighted over here in red, uh, because these are more technically difficult for undergraduates. Uh, they, uh, it's based on Weintraub, and I know there are some people in the audience who probably uh, are familiar with this. The, because the two curves are independent, um, it's uh, ambiguous what impact falling wages might have. You actually could get uh, increased employment, reduced employment, or no change at all depending on the slopes of the curves. So I'm not going to go through all of that. And then finally, uh, there's a discussion of an attempt to restore the classical results <laughs> with the Pagu uh, and Patinkin effects. Um, but we discuss the uh, difference between the notional and effective demand and the Clower contributions. Um, we then build up the aggregate spending uh, model, which uh, is based on a constant price aggregate supply curve up to full capacity. So for the purpose of this chapter, we just assume that um, the price level is constant, and then in the next chapter, we relax that assumption. So demand is going to drive output, since we have uh, 
horizontal uh, agate supply curve. Um, we discuss in here why uh, D equals Z no matter the uh, whatever point in the multiplier you happen to be. Uh, the post Keynesians in here will remember that in the um, 1980s, there was a debate that was set up by Asimakopoulos, who argued that saving and investment don't come to equality until the multiplier process has worked itself out and everyone is scratching their head and trying to find a resolution to it. It's actually right there in the general theory. Keynes it, it explains it as being uh, a process of inventory ad adjustment. So we explain this very clearly so that undergrads won't fall into the trap of thinking that you need the multiplier process for saving to equal investment. Okay. Um, we then relax the assumption and develop the aggregate supply, the curve. Firms' uh, responses to an increase of demand could be any combination, a, a quantity adjustment only, price adjustment, or both prices and quantities change. We take a markup approach, uh, markup over labor costs, which is typical in uh, post-Keynesian work. Firms are price setters. Uh, at some earlier sessions today, people talked about power. Uh, market power matters. We don't start with a, uh, uh, an assumption that uh, firms are perfectly competitive. They all strive to get market share so that they can do this, so that they, they can mark up over costs and ensure that they're able to cover costs and have profits left over. The money wage is a function of bargaining strength. The real wage is not something that workers can bargain over because it's a function of the ratio between two price levels. They can bargain over the money wage, but they don't have control over the price level, for example, the CPI. So it's a, uh, something that workers cannot control. The, we conclude that the aggregate supply curve is very flat over the normal range. Um, so that we return to the earlier uh, conclusion, aggregate demand drives production in the normal ranges. Uh, there's a discussion of this empirical reality, which is a puzzle for the mainstream, uh, that labor productivity is highly pro-cyclical, which doesn't make too much sense in the uh, mainstream approach. We then move into policy. Um, and uh, we first uh, present it at a very basic level, and then we come back to it and go into detail. So this would be appropriate for um, intro level, and then we have uh, a series of four chapters that come back to policy, which I'll show up in just a second, that go into all of these things in more detail. That's for the intermediate level, or even a uh, master's level. Um, how is fiscal policy conducted? And of course, we take the um, functional finance approach. Uh, I don't. I think Bill sort of skipped over, but we have a long discussion at the very beginning of, of the book on public purpose. So we come back to it here. The the goal of fiscal policy and monetary policy should be to fulfill the public purpose, and um, we talk about the sectoral balances approach. Talk about how monetary policy is conducted. We reject the arguments about central banks are or should be independent. They cannot be independent. Um, they have to target rates, which means that they must coordinate with the Treasury. So we go through the coordination between the central bank and the Treasury. Central bank makes and receives payments on behalf of the Treasury. So the one function of the central bank, and this was the first function of central banks, is to act as the Treasury's bank. Um, and so we talk about th this connection uh, between the Treasury uh, because all the payments have to go through the central bank and they have to be received through the central bank. Central banks accommodate demand for reserves, so this is the uh, ho horizontal as post Keynesian approach. Um, we use uh, what Scott called the laser like focus on the payment system which is the second most important thing that central banks do. Um, 
they got to make check, make sure that the check's clear. And if they're doing this, they cannot possibly be independent. An independent central bank might bounce treasury checks for insufficient funds. We know in the real world they will not do this. Absolutely will not. They won't bounce <coughs> bank checks, period. Um, I mean, unless the individual who wrote the check uh, has insufficient funds. But they don't bounce checks between banks because a bank is short reserves. Their, uh, their focus is on making sure the payment system is absolutely smooth. And since there are literally billions and billions of payments every minute, they have to be very focused on this. Um, we go through some balance sheets, and then we, I think it's in a box, we talk about Rommel, uh, who had a very uh, nice paper explaining why taxes for revenue are obsolete. Um, Advanced material, we go through sterilization. This is usually presented as a choice that central banks might make or might choose not to do, and we explain why actually it's not a choice. Uh, we explain why the U.S. doesn't rely on Chinese savings to finance our government. <laughs> All right, finally, these are the, the uh, four more detailed uh, <coughs> chapters that reinforce the policy principles. Fiscal policy and policy space, talking about uh, fiscal sustainability, so we go a bit through that uh, literature and explain what's wrong with all of that. Um, monetary policy space, and then finally a detailed treatment of the open economy. And again, uh, some of these are difficult, at least for American students, because Americans uh, usually have not uh, thought much about the foreign sector. And uh, that is it. Pardon me. Oh, sorry. I wasn't fighting. I read the last topic to link up to Keynes was on uh, in the role of investment in the cycle and then the uh, contributions of Minsky. So all of that is uh, also treated in two chapters. Okay. Okay, um, I'm going to not take up too much time. Um, I'm not going to uh, go into a lot of detail about content. I'm going to make some fairly ad hoc sort of observations that came to me a couple of nights ago. Um, yeah. But I will talk briefly about the labour market and trade at the end, assuming time permits. Okay, worth pointing out some of the other textbooks in the illustrious uh, stable that uh, Palgrave and Dylan have, which includes those by Mankiw and Krugman. Um, <laughs> I guess it does seem appropriate that we've finally reached a textbook because it is 20 years, and I think Warren mentioned 25, since things started happening in terms of MMT, Randy's book and the Coffee um, Research Centre at Newcastle started. Um, and in the interim, of course, many people have made many important contributions to MMT. Um, as Bill has mentioned, the book will upset many, including some of our so-called post-Keynesian comrades, and will certainly irritate orthodoxy to the point of possibly promoting debate. I suspect not. Bring it on. Um, over the <coughs> last few years, MMT has become somewhat isolated. Um, one could speculate, in Australia at least, that the interchange or interaction with orthodoxy ceased <coughs> about 10 years ago, a bit longer, I think, uh, at a um, session in Canberra, which I was present at as well. Uh, Bill asked the head of research at the Reserve Bank, David Gruen, as to when the last um, RBA, Reserve Bank, check had bounced and uh, there was a pregnant pause. I don't know if there's been much interaction since. Um, clearly there is a concern or has been a concern in the past that a 
small group of MMT aficionados will continue going through the fine detail about the payment system, etc., etc. Uh, so I'm really encouraged by the fact that the, the nature of this conference has changed for this year and it's very much reflected in the numbers present. And I think this is really where we've got to get moving in terms of getting the message well and truly out. Um, Bill mentioned the INET book. I sort of picked up that point here as well. There clearly is a, a large group of, of uh, disenchanted students internationally. Various student bodies are being set up protesting at the uh, rather sterile and irrelevant uh, stuff that they're taught. Um, unfortunately, um, they haven't been well served by heterodox economics or academics purporting to be heterodox. Um, and just mouthing the word pluralism doesn't get you very far. And uh, clearly, it's our hope that this group internationally will pick up the book and read it. Um, the role of institutions, and this is one of the interesting aspects, I think, of um, the way economics has changed, macroeconomics has changed, at the risk of engaging in anecdote. Um, I did A-level economics at school starting in 1965, and in 1966, for the second year of A-level, we studied Lipsy's positive economics. And in those naive times, that perhaps looked like a leap forward, because a lot of economics prior to that was taught in terms of how certain institutions work. Um, some universities joint board who uh, marked the A-level exam papers obviously didn't really approve of Lipsy or maybe I was just incompetent because I got an E at A-level, which is, doesn't stand for excellent, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> the point of, of referring to Lipsy, and indeed all, pretty well all the macro textbooks which have followed him, is that macroeconomic theory and policy has become increasingly divorced from institutional practice, adding credibility to a whole series of ridiculous theories. Um, and it seems to me, in a sense, we've come the full circle because MMT is very much grounded in institutional practice, and so it should be. And the reaction of macro textbooks to uh, the mere culpa on the part of the Bank of England um, has been somewhat laughable. Um, I've looked at texts where they've tried to talk about the payment system and talk about the fact that the, the central bank sets the interest rate, but they've kept their baggage, including the uh, quantity theory of money and the money multiplier, so they come up with total incoherence. Anyway, mm. now to a, a few points about the labour market as taught in the textbook and also in trade. Um, I think one of the key contributions... Uh, in the labour market textbook is a discussion of the labour force framework so that students do have a solid conceptual basis for understanding the generation of monthly labour force stats. And the official uh, measure of uh, unemployment as provided in Australia by the ABS and all the other agencies around the world is the uh, coffee measure which has been around for some years, the rate of labour underutilisation and essentially that measure which I think is a really important measure and it's a sort of measure that should be um, calculated on an ongoing basis and unfortunately coffee has ceased to do it but I think it's a very important part of getting a message out. That measure includes underemployment and it includes hidden or what's referred to as discouraged unemployment. In other words, people out of the labour force who under more encouraging circumstances about the possibility of getting a job would re-enter the labour market. So we include the numbers of officially unemployed 
sorry, I shouldn't say numbers, the hours of work desired by the officially unemployed, the hours of work desired by the underemployed, the extra hours, and the, some estimate of the desired hours of work on the part of those currently outside the labour market, outside the labour force, who would be attracted back into the labour force if the rate of unemployment was 2% or 3%. And because we've taken account of people outside the uh, labour force, we have to include that both in the numerator and the denominator. The key point is that all these measures are in hours, and it's fairly obvious because if you're thinking about underemployment, underemployment can include people who are looking for an extra two hours a week of work <coughs> or an extra... 15 hours a week, and clearly we should not measure those people as contributing equally to a measure of underutilisation. Key point about this measure of un unemployment, and indeed the official measure for that matter, is that it's not linked to some notion of a Nehru or something similar. In other words, it's not based on an inflation-based uh, measure, uh, a rate of unemployment consistent with some stable rate of inflation. One irony is that the Australian Bureau of Statistics finally came to its senses about the importance of underemployment, and this is going back how many years, Bill? Sorry? Eight. Eight, right. Um, because the coffee measure had been out there and was reported by, by some. And so the ABS now have a uh, measure of underemployment which doesn't take account of hours. So you, when, you measure, when you add the underemployment rate to the unemployment rate, you get quite a large number. Um, which actually is a distortion. The rule of thumb we discovered when the coffee series was, being, was constructed was you could typically measure the official unemployment rate and double it, and that would give you a rough measure of the rate of labour under utilisation. OK, moving to trade. Um, back in the early 2000s, I used to attend the SHE conference, in fact I still do. This is the Society of Heterodox Economists, um, which meet in Sydney every December. And for a number of years, our colleagues, hearing the glad tidings about the job guarantee, would always raise the issue of the exchange rate. So, essentially, if you have a country that's running a job guarantee successfully, it's going to be running at full employment, it's going to be growing faster than its trading partners. Inevitably, the imports in overall terms would be sucked in relative to exports, and if the exchange rate is flexible, as it should be, of course, then there will be issues of a currency depreciation. Now, the inference was that slower growth, more unemployment and a stronger exchange rate was better than full employment and a currency depreciation, which is a curious point of view. Of course, a depreciation under Marshall Lerner has the effect of doing something about the trade deficit. So there are, that is why you have a flexible exchange rate. Uh, of course, integral to the uh, policy, to have uh, flexibility in policy design is to have a flexible exchange rate. And a flexible exchange rate per se rules out balance of payments crises. The issue then, of course, is the composition of the balance of payments, not whether you're going to have a balance of payments problem itself. And in particular, if you have a persistent current account deficit, whether that's sustainable. Um, in other words, would a job guarantee economy suffer a persistent current account 
uh, sorry, current account uh, problem and a uh, exchange rate appreciation. In Chapter 30, in fact, we argue there is no evidence of any country with a flexible exchange rate suffering a persistent depreciation. We talk about capital controls as well. And one of the important points that we always used to make apropos of the arguments about depreciation was that really a fully employed economy is not just good for workers, it's good for the private sector in general. And domestic profitability in a fully employed economy may well encourage capital inflow anyway. So if you're particularly worried about a depreciation and the consequences for inflation, then it's worth noting that the uh, likelihood of an ongoing depreciation is very small. In the, re in the policy debates chapter, chapter 30, there's a range of topics discussed, and uh, Bill went through and, and uh, showed you the full uh, outline of the chapter. Um, the reason for mentioning that chapter is the discussion of three currency crises. The infamous ERM crisis in the UK in the early 90s, the Asian financial crisis, and the Mexican peso crisis. And these are really important uh, case studies of countries which attempted to operate with a fixed exchange rate and the major pitfalls associated with that, a real problem of when a country responds to pressure on the exchange rate and devalues, and in all cases, these countries failed to respond quickly, and indeed didn't therefore uh, move to a flexible exchange rate quickly enough. There are arguments for fixed exchange, rate. it's exchange rates. It's supposed to bring about economic discipline within the country. Um, here are three examples where it manifestly did not work. Final comments. We all hope the textbook will be an important vehicle for the transmission of the MMT framework based to students and the interested public. Uh, my experience of teaching MMT at uh, third year and more recently at first year, at least until the end of last year, is that good students really do engage with it. They accept the fact that uh, critical thinking is important and that debate and controversy is exciting from the point of view of education. And so I... I think it's a, a very positive thing that we've finally finished this textbook and I hope it'll uh, be widely distributed and read by many and create debate and I suspect there will be quite a lot. Thank you. So I'm just going to recap for a, a short period and then we'll take questions. Um, you might have been wondering especially non-economists in the room, you know, what the Keynes... Well, why we talk so much about Keynes and the classic, which was a huge debate in the 1930s that, with the onset of the Great Depression. And you might re recall that one, some of the reviewers of a, the, for the publisher said, oh, that's all old-fashioned, you know, we don't do that anymore. <laughs> well, the problem is that they do do it via assertion. And so all of the contemporary, the way they use different language and they dress it up differently, but the, the, all of the contemporary debates out there now about welfare, about wage setting, about government spending, and all of the contemporary debates were really done in the 1930s. And so there's nothing really new that they're saying. The, 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 the mainstream debates now would just, the arguments to justify the policy positions taken now were demolished in the 1930s. And they just sort of snuck back. They just reinvented themselves. And so we felt it was very important to 
to revisit that because there's just nothing new. Um, the last thing I want to talk about for, for two minutes or less is this concept of an MMT university. At the moment, it's just an, I've announced that we're starting an MMT university. It's very nascent in its uh, evolution. Uh, uh, we're, we, we haven't got any affiliation with a formal degree or diploma awarding institution or institution, so we're not holding out that anybody who enrolled in this institution would earn any, any qualification, although in, in times to come I hope to have discussions with universities uh, to create what, what are called articulation arrangements where if you do, uh, you form a formal partnership where you do two subjects in the MMT university, uh, for another university will give it credit for their, their award program. Now that's, that's some time <coughs> off yet. The, the reality is while, while we would love to make the MMT, MMT University and the courses we propose to offer free to everybody, we just can't do that because resource, real resources are involved, uh, particularly time. And so we're, we're going to create a not, as, as a not-for-profit organisation so it's not going to be making money to, to create excess over costs, but we have to, we'll have to charge tuition fees. And we don't know what they'll be yet. Uh, we don't know how, what the market is yet. But we're deeply concerned with equity, and so obviously we'll be deeply concerned with making sure that uh, participation in this is as broad as possible and not not uh, undermined by access due to fees. And, uh, you know, my, my philosophical position where I, in, in terms of creating this institution or, or proposing the creation was that I think back to the early, early days in Australian history where workers were, used to attend night school, <laughs> trade unions used to put on schools for, for, for their workers to, to train them in literature and and to become well read, you know, tip mostly men, uh, tradesmen, could become experts in poetry and literature. And, uh, and so I, I sense that we've destroyed all of that. And I sense there's a really, I get hundreds of emails about this, that we really want to learn this stuff. And we, we, we want to learn it in a formal, disciplined, structured way. And so this is the response to that. And uh, what we need, and this is now a call for help in a way, uh, what, to make it work, I mean obviously it will integra integrate with the textbook, the curriculum in the macroeconomics. It won't be a, a broad based program, it's just going to teach people MMT. And, uh, uh, but what we need to make it happen is uh, help, and I'm thinking uh, people who are good at IT that can help with portals, uh, learning management systems, uh, those sort of things. I mean, we've got enough teaching resources among the gang, but uh, we need, I need help in uh, IT resources, uh, uh, people who are, are good at uh, educational policy, uh, administrative type of things, and uh, to not to put a crude point on it, we need money. So I'm, 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 I'm looking for people who have got plenty of it, who want to... Uh, 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 help sponsor it and uh, the, the more money we get by way of sponsorship the lower the fees are going to be uh, and, I'm, and I'm in discussions with people at the moment to create a sort of a new body which I, which I will call for the moment an MMT foundation uh, because one of the reasons the progressive side of politics and uh, uh, one of the reasons why the mainstream economists get so much traction is because Wall Street funds all these think tanks. And what, what the progressive side of uh, politics and uh, knowledge accumulation have to do is address that. And we can't do it without money, it's impossible. So I'm, going to, I'm trying to create an MMT foundation which will help to sub subsidise the, the, universe, the, the teaching program we plan, but it will also create a marketing and uh, uh, dissemination machinery that can help 
everybody in the room here that's across various disciplines get their messages out. So that's the last thing I'll say. And who's the moderator? Me, probably. <laughs> so if there's any questions, I think we've got about how much time we've got. Better look up. The, yeah, hold on, I'll just uh, make. What's that? Okay, so we've got 25 minutes. Uh, it's 5:20. We've actually got. Yeah, I just looked up, my, looked up my clock. It's five past eight, and that's Australian time. So, uh, uh, Saturday morning. Okay, so we've got about fifteen minutes. Um, okay, so I'm not an economist. There are a bunch of us in here who are not economists. We're just average people who are on the grassroots side of this. Um, would we be able to understand this book, and would we be able to understand it without taking black? Look, I think when I said we're going to integrate with the textbook, the if 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 you go if you go if this textbook is used as we hope it is in a, a number of undergraduate programs, then the pedagogy is will be at the undergraduate level, and that's a quality control. You can't dilute that, even though it has been diluted by in this neoliberal era. The standards of our universities have fallen. Uh, but the, the point the point is that if you do this use this textbook within a conventional undergraduate program, there's no compromises. It's a it's it's <coughs> in some places it's quite tough, and it will be up to the and we, 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 we'll create an online presence, a resource centre, uh, which would have uh, got, uh, model programs that, that various uh, colleagues will will develop for us. So. Uh, the standard of mathematical skills in uh, Europe is higher than it is in America, I think, and uh, probably higher in Australia than it is in America. The stand, the uh, dif different uh, secondary school education systems prepare students in different way for undergraduate education. So we will have a, uh, a, a, a context-specific guidelines onto which sections. Uh, because some of it's very difficult and some of it's very basic. And uh, so a, 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 an astute lecturer who takes up the book will have very good, good material to guide them on, on what's suitable for their particular students prepared through their secondary school system. But if you do it through the MMT University, we are going to create programs that are really accessible, that are really basic and... Uh, 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 what I would call without being, without, don't interpret this as being insulting, primary school level MMT. And uh, uh, through to much more sophisticated understandings as far as you want to go. Now that's all, we haven't done that yet, but that's, that's our discussion on our side. The aim is to, the MMT University is a public education institution, not a degree awarding institution. It's meant to train people in literacy, and you learn literacy uh, in English language, or whatever language you speak, in primary school. <coughs> yes, and then you, and then you. Uh, I'm kind of an undergrad, so this, this textbook would work really well for someone like me. Like, why not taking Intermediate Macro uh, with Greg Mackey's book, A Strategic in, in Miami? You are. Yeah. Sorry, so, sorry to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess like if I could get this book, my hands on this book like that, as like a supplemental reading, that would be like oh, an okay thing. Like I could do it at that level. I might kind of right? Uh, de definitely. Uh, I mean, this is pitched at an undergraduate level. I mean, we've all the developed. The three of us have been. You look at our hair. <laughs> we've been teaching for a long time, and we really. I think we, but between the different educational systems we really do understand what an undergraduate program is. So it's not, it's not pie in the sky stuff. This is meant to be a teaching resource that we use in our own programs. Rand is using it now. Martin used it last semester. Uh, uh, you, sorry. Since Jamie Galbraith described at lunch today how MMT, uh, how traditional heterodox economic departments have not adopted any of these MMT concepts or people, how are you going to sell this book? Why are they going to uh, start using your textbook? Well, we, UMKC has produced a, a lot of professors who are around the country, and the same has happened in Newcastle. And there are people who 
we're trained in heterodox economics, not necessarily MMT, we're looking for a, a textbook that is consistently heterodox from start to finish, because th those don't exist. So there, actually, the number of classrooms that can be used in is many hundreds. Okay. What, is it going to be used in a mainstream class at Harvard? No. But most in America, okay. most students do not go to Harvard, right? They're at public schools and at liberal arts universities all over the country. 5,000 of them. So that's where we're aiming, not, not the, the 15 that under no circumstance would they use it or allow it to be used. But there's plenty of places all over the country. And, and one of the things that's happening is that uh, Related areas in social sciences are getting so annoyed with with the irrelevance of formal economics that areas like political science and international studies are starting to develop new programs in political economy. And I'll give you an example. I'll be in Helsinki in a couple of, uh, the week after next, where we're launching a program in political economy, where our textbook is already the introductory textbook is already being used and. And I'll be teaching into that program for them uh, in February, and so these sort of and that's in that's outside the economics department. Right. That's in uh, political science and international studies, and uh, so 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 there are broad-minded people within universities that are sensing a because universities, of course, are always struggling with uh, student load because that's typically how funding occurs. And political science departments are seeing this as a way of capture, capture students. And uh, you know, I can give you another example, of, not related to textbook, but these sort of trends, which will influence our, uh, the, how much people will take up our textbook. At Sydney University, for example, the Department of Economics, there were, was a heterodox group there. Randy knows it, Martin knows it. And the, the, the mainstream department sort of said, we're going to get rid of, there's been conflict for years. And the mainstream department said, we're going to get rid of this lot of lefties forever. <laughs> and so they, they conspired with the faculty of business to kick them out of the faculty and shunt, shunt them off into the faculty of arts and social sciences. I'm not sure what it's actually called, but that's what, what it was. Thinking that they'd dry, die on the vine. That if they, got, they were outside the business school, they'd, they'd lose all their enrolments in their subjects and they'd die. Well, what these guys went into the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences, introduced a new first year subject based upon heterodox thinking, <laughs> and now the exactly opposite to what was predicted happened. They're flooded with enrolments, and the mainstream uh, 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 economics department is, is facing extinction. And, and, and so right now, the, right now there's these trends, but think big. Yeah, we all hope yeah. build think big. That, that we're we're going to become mainstream eventually. Right. And we've we've had this plan for years of of uh, building PhD oh. students to pump them out, and because they're the future adopters of the textbook, and that's the snowball effect. And it's not going to take five years. It takes a long time. These are gestation in the long view, but it's going to happen. And so this, this, we're just setting the scene. It's going to happen. <coughs> yeah, and, uh, student um, disenchantment will uh, give some impetus to the process too. We hope. Here, uh, I want to first thank you guys because I think this is a huge piece of work that's going to really help the general student population. I, I just recently completed my MBA. I have three degrees, two master's degrees, and I've probably taken Macro 101 or intermediate macro level and micro level courses in my between my engineering, MPA, MBA, like five times, um, to the point that I'm sick of hearing Bernanke and Mancu. So uh, I would say to the students who are looking forward to reading this book, before this book, students like me all only had SSRN, your, all your amazing YouTube videos, the work that Modern Money Network has done, and if you and then a lot of work, obviously, uh, uh, Steve Keen had done as well, and on his channel. And if you watch those videos in the long form three or four times, over and over and over again, over maybe a year of time, from that personal experience, I was able to critique in a deep way the deficiencies in any standard graduate text or 
uh, an un for them an undergraduate text. And so I think this is, but the thing is that can't, that's not the expectation of most students. Most students aren't going to be that wonkish. And so the fact that this is coming out, I think, a huge applause to you guys. It's, it's really amazing work. I'm really happy about that. Um, my question is around uh, the treatment of uh, key historical figures in the, the 20th century, uh, particularly like Hicks, ISLM, um, because he ended up basically uh, saying that it's all yes <laughs> towards the end, uh, and then as well as uh, key central bank figures uh, like Mariner Eccles, um, and any other historical figures of note. Like, how do you guys address uh, those people? Well, we definitely have Hicks. We have his own words, yes. We discuss ISLM and then have a box uh, <coughs> going through his own rejection. And, and he didn't go far enough, so we add something to it. Uh, it's not a book on economic history. Yes. It's not a book on history of thought. It, 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 so, you know, it's horses for courses. It, it's a macroeconomics textbook, conceptual development of the discipline. But it has enough historical pointers and contexts that students know where things fit and where it's, where these ideas came from and how they've developed a bit. But it's not a dedicated book on economic history or history of thought. Uh, did you want to ask? Yeah, you mentioned you, you uh, didn't carry over anything from mainstream economics. Well, I just want you to know that my last paper on the job guarantee was published in a mainstream <laughs> 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 Uh, so this, this, uh, are there any plans of uh, any vision in Spanish and Portuguese? Uh, it, it's 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 possible. My last two books have been published, uh, are coming out in Spanish, but they're books and they're 200, 400, 500 pages. This is 800 pages with really very difficult typesetting, and I'm not sure the market. The, the publisher would think that's yeah because you have like a uh, and um, you know yeah but that's a ma works. that's a huge market and uh, the publishers are commercial oriented they're not publishers aren't publishing this to for, to advance MMT they think they'll make money with that yeah but maybe with some university because in Latin America it's like uh, you can publish with the university your textbook you know so and just, look I can't we can't answer that at the moment but. Uh, you know, in terms of the last two books I've written, it's just because a couple of people like them and who, who could write, translate them, and they offered, and we found the publisher to do it. So that it might happen, who knows? Okay. Uh, um, Bill, I've been using some of the online learning platforms for the last four or five years, and they've matured uh, quite nicely. Uh, why would you use a platform like that? Because they, cost, they, because they cost money. Well. I mean, these were built by uh, built by computer science professors, most of them. And, uh, you, you can use things like, so for example, open source uh, learning management systems like Moodle. It's fine, but the problem is to make it configurable. So, so the sort of free price to download is a bit of a trap, because to actually make it functional, you've got to put a lot of time in and a lot of labour. So. We get there. There's great learning management systems out there, but they cost money. So the first thing I've got to do is get funds to build up a resource so that I can make these decisions. How about uh, something like EDX or Coursera or Udacity, people yeah. like that? Yeah, they're all they're all they're all charging. And and uh, you know things like Blackboard. And most a lot of universities use Blackboard. That's really expensive. And this is this is a. Uh, and you know we're not wanting to, in the terminology, gold plate the, the cost structure. We want to keep the cost structure as minimal as possible because then the fees will be low and then more people will be able to do it. Have you considered with diversity? I mean, of course, that's totally free. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we've also got to maintain quality control. And, right. and, and, and the, the other problem is that uh, a lot of the open source learning management systems don't don't really aren't really written to collect fees and have enrollments and that. They're, they're dissemination type things, you know. Whereas, whereas if you want to run a run a operation that can manage enrollments and uh, have quality con uh, 
or sanitation issues and that, that costs, that's difficult. Yeah, right. so, so the first thing we need is money and that's what I'm trying to get at the moment. What about uh, outside academia? I mean, educating central bankers or people outside academia, right? Yeah, look, we've got, I've got plans. I've always got plans. <laughs> at the moment, I'm, I'm, doing, I'm setting up workshops for trade union officials in Australia. And that's a model. They basically have no economics training at all, but they're, they're in the workplace bargaining for better conditions for their workers in an environment that's wanting to attack workers' rights. And so, you know, that'll become a sort of prototype effort to, to, to have targeted workshop type training and stuff like that. But as, but as best as possible, we want to try to minimise labour resources so that, you know, we, we're, all, we're all doing stacks of other things and we can't be going out doing, we're not a training, we don't, I don't want to set up a training organisation. So a lot of it will be just online stuff. Last, Dr. last question. I sure. Think. Dr. Mitchell, Mr. Dr. Ray, uh, I'm sorry I don't remember your name. Um, Martin, Martin, thank you so much. Real Progressives, one of our pillars is education, and obviously we're not educators, but to the degree by which we can educate, we try by using folks like yourself. Is there a way that we could, not right now, I'm not like negotiating here, but the idea would be is there a potential for partnerships and things like that where we could bring folks in because we want to definitely get as many activists trained as possible to learn this stuff so we can change the world much quicker than other people are predicting. Yeah, one of the things that we're talking about is quality control and uh, and setting and creating standards. And uh, I've had a little chat to Warren about this before. And uh, we've, we've now got, I mean, MMT, we used to say, we used to joke that we could count the number of MMTs on one hand. And we Remember that, Warren? And, and now there's millions, and we're in the second and third generation in MTs. And, and saying this respect, respectfully, the problem then is that we lose control of standards. And so you get these uh, debates in the blogosphere that, that effectively uh, mislead because of the problem of lack of standards. And so any partnerships we want to go into uh, have to be within a quality control framework. And if we're setting up an educational institution, that's certainly got to be it. But I'm really open to partnerships. Very good. Because partnerships distribute effort and, and include people that are, that are enthusiastic and wanting to be part of the mission, and that's a great thing. Sure. Okay, so thanks very much.